welcome everybody back again. Don't forget to sign your name in the chat box. I know everybody's done a really good job of that already, but make sure you sign in first and last name and your agency. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Christy Hannon to, for our last presentation. Great, thanks Heather. Uh, so I get the honor of introducing another amazing person from our field, Dr. Ruslan Slutsky. Um, and I wanted to let you know, in addition to his bio that you may have seen on the agenda, uh, Dr. Slutsky is a parent of two beautiful children. Um, he's a professor in the education department at University of Toledo. Um, in his role as a teacher, he is helping prepare the next generation of early childhood professionals who are coming into um, our workplaces. And that's such a critical role that um, he and so many others play in our community. Um, his teaching areas are early childhood education, language development, and children's play. And he's also a qualitative researcher. He uh, studies the impact of learning communities on student learning, um, the Reggio Emilia approach from Italy, Head Start and children's play, especially the area of war and superhero play. And I happen to know that um, in his research, he interacts with other faculty from around the world looking at those kinds of issues and how um, they may look similar or different across different um, cultures and countries. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce to all of you, Dr. Ruslan Slutsky. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Han and I really appreciate that. And I'm gonna share my screen so uh, we can get started and I hope this works. We can't see yet. Yeah, there's, it says preparing slides. Okay. So it's loading. So. so Zoom wants to access my slides. I said, okay. Can you see them? Okay. All right, so here we go. So we're gonna talk today a little bit about um, children's play and really just the importance of children's play. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Okay, perfect. And, and really, really thinking about how play is changing because I think we've had folks present today on emotional development, social development, um, how academics are creeping into early childhood at, at a much quicker pace than I think we in early childhood really would like to see. So I, I think really reconceptualizing and rethinking play and really what play is, is really important, but also not to forget that play is changing. And there are elements in, in, in the world of young children now that is really reshaping the way they play and more importantly, the way they choose to play. And I think you know we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of those things today and just kind of try to figure out um, to what capacity those things are impacting the lives of children. So as I go to the next slide. So play in early childhood, we automatically use the word play, right? We just, it, it's, it's the way kids interact with the world. It's the way they learn new concepts and it's the way they develop skills. Are you all seeing this little blurb on my screen here? Or is that just me on the bottom? Yeah, we yeah, see we the see blurb the and we don't see your face anymore. We just see the slide with the yeah, that's, blurby thing. Yeah, because now I don't Can see my face it? either. I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying. It's like a little box here. Is that there you right? go. That's that, okay. that was okay. helpful. Perfect. All right, fantastic. So I'm going to ask all of you to really just in one word, what is play actually? If you had to explain to someone what play is, what one word would you use to describe play? Because it is such a dynamic, such a complex word. So fun, freedom, okay, fun, fun, open-ended, Exploration, exploration, laughter, explore. 
imagination, joy, learning, fun, enjoyable, engaging. Awesome. So, so I kind of prepared a little list for us to just kind of talk through as we think about this really complex word that children get into. And then we've got creativity, everything is play, curiosity. So here are some things to think about and think about play as discovery. It is one of the ways young children discover the world around them, interact with the environment, interact with, them, with themselves and others, learn about themselves. Play is also a therapy for children. It's a way for them to release stress. In a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about Freud and his uh, conceptualization of that. But kids don't get to talk a lot to other adults for therapy release or stress release. So play serves for them that kind of avenue through art, through playing social dramatic play. It's a chance for them to kind of deal with some of those anxieties they see and, and hear around them. Um, it's a social interaction. Play is social. Play is, is where kids learn how to interact with other people, how to share, how to solve conflict, how to resolve conflict when two kids can't get along or have a dispute. How do they figure out how to resolve that conflict? Well, they, they do it through trial and error. Sometimes adults intervene, but it's that great avenue. It's that great place where they're able to try those things out. They get to solve problems. They get to explore and use language in basic and more sophisticated ways. They get to explore new vocabulary as they play with artifacts and objects and toys around them. They use their imagination to think outside the box. There are no boundaries. Play could be on the moon. It could be underwater. It could be anywhere the child's mind is willing to take them. It's innate. We are all born to play. That is the beauty of play. We all want to play, even as adults. We strive to play. We play differently as adults. You know, we may watch TV, we may go to dinner, we can do other things with friends, but we still have the propensity to want to play. It is a natural part of who we are as humans. Kids experiment their gender roles through play. They take on role play situations, such as mom, dad, brother, sister, pizza owner, construction worker, police officer, and so on. They take risks in play. They go up the slide. They hang down the monkey bars. They're creative and they imitate things they hear, things they see. It's fun. They test their hypotheses. They have ideas. And then they get to try them out through play. They can make mistakes. They manipulate objects. They explore how they work. And then they interact with the environment. And we can go on and on and on and on. The list is exhaustive because there's really no one good way to really explain or describe play. Somebody said it's everything, and I agree. It really is a little bit of everything. And it's one of the greatest gifts kids have is that right to play and the right to explore and their right to learn. So when we think about play, we have to think about what is then not play. And I dichotomize it in, in, in a very, very basic way. Play to me is always voluntary. We choose to play. Play is an option we opt into. And I, def I de kind of describe non-play as it's work. It's required. All of us go to work. It is not play, although some of us do play at work and we have fun, but it's not play. Play we opt into, kids want to play. Once we give kids an assignment, it's no longer play, it's work. If kids are drawing and I come up and say, hey, draw me a house, all of a sudden, I've taken the play out of their experience and I made them do, that. I made them do something specific. It's no longer play. It's, be, it's becoming a little bit of work. Play spontaneous. It just happens. Kids say, let's play this. Let's play that. Work is scheduled. We have a time when we have to go into work. It is not a time when we play. Play is process focused. We focus on the process of what we do during play. How we act. How we interact with others the kind of things we're learning. Work is product focused. Well, how productive are we during the time we're at work? Play is choiceful. There's so many choices we can do in play. There are, like we, I mentioned earlier, no boundaries in play. It can be anything you want to be. Your imagination dictates that. Work is narrow. We all specialize in something. I specialize in education. 
I can't do chemistry. I can't do other things. It's very, very narrow in terms of what we do. Kids through play have many of those trial and error options. Kids can play doctor. They can play astronaut. They can play whatever they want. They have limitless choices. And play is intrinsic. We do play for the pleasure of playing. It gives us personal reward to play. Work is extrinsic. We do it for a specific reason. Money, insurance, whatever it may be. So there is a dichotomous difference between when we talk about children playing versus children working. Also, play should have a development, a development appropriate component. Children should be allowed to engage in experiences that they can do and get to choose. Play should be a place where they can succeed. But play is also a place where kids need to fail. And we often forget that. Failure is a lesson learned. Piaget always says that kids go through disequilibrium when things don't go their way. And they have to rebound from that. They have to figure out and solve a problem to get back to kind of what we call equilibrium. It's sort of like when you're driving and you get a flat tire and everything goes into disequilibrium and you have to somehow accommodate that, right? You have to fix your flat tire. And when you fix your flat tire, you've, you've kind of succeeded and you're back to that equilibrium. Same thing with kids. Though That failure helps them rethink, reconceptualize the world around them. That rethinking is very, very important. Failure is important for kids. And play is the best place for kids to fail because they fail on their terms. And that to me is really important. They fail on their terms. It's at their level. It's at their thought process. And it's at their ability to solve it. And I think those are really, really meaningful ways of how development appropriate play is and how important it is to the lives of children. Also, as adults, we tend to push children to things that they value as adults. It's things we see as important that kids should be doing. We tend to push mathematics and literacy skills on kids because those have become important outcome measures for kindergarten readiness and beyond. Think about how elementary kids are now tested in what skills are important. Their numeracy skills and their literacy skills. And so as adults, we try to push those skills onto kids even earlier. And so at the cost of taking away some of that natural play that many kids want, want to explore. So keeping a DAP is really, really important and giving kids the freedom to choose is really, really important. I know as adults, we wanna have a say in the outcome and the type of experiences kids have, but one of the best experiences, just simply letting them play and simply having that ability to succeed on their own, fail on their own, and rethink and resolve on their own. Also, when we look at the research on children who lack play, we find out that play is essential for a healthy brain development. The way our brain is wired, the way our brain develops, it develops when children engage in play. When children, when children play, their brains grow. If they do not play, their brains do not grow or do not grow at the same rate or capacity or to the same size. All those are important things that have tremendous impacts on them as they get older and as they enter preschools and obviously formal education and beyond. If normal play experiences are absent throughout a child's life, that child is more likely to become withdrawn, to isolate. They become more depressed and more aggressive. And, and, and that's very simple. It's because they simply lack the skills to engage with others on a social level. They lack social maturity that often they develop and learn through just playing. Think about all the social things we learn by simply interacting with others. Think about all the things kids are learning by simply talking, playing, and developing ideas with other kids. So play is at the heart of everything that's developmentally right for children to be able to do. So let's talk about it from outcomes. And one of the first ones is emotional. And I'd like to break up emotional and social differently because they are two different things. I think um, Alyssa mentioned it this morning and, and I do think we cram it together often as socio-emotional, but it really is two separate things. And in here, I kind of turn to a psychologist who we all have heard of before and, and that's Freud. Uh, we don't talk about Freud often anymore, but I think the one place we still do in terms of play is in the emotional development. 
And Freud really taught us that children gain this notion of emotional understanding through play. Play allows children to gain control of their emotions. And when we think about, you know, kids having a traumatic experience, an emotional experience, think about a doctor's office where a child receives a shot. And then the child has to deal with anxiety and pain of that shot. And then the child has to emotionally react and respond to that experience. Well, the child replaced the episode in the context of play. And I know I've seen this many times in preschool classrooms where a child picks up a teddy bear or a doll or another stuffed animals and gives a shot to that animal to deal with their stress and anxiety and their pain. And now the teddy bear or the doll or whatever the subject is, is now dealing with it as the child is. The child can cope together with the stuffed animal. That's a pretty powerful emotional support that the child has. So thinking about it from that level, from a very Freudian emotional level, and we've all, and we've all seen this happen. We've all seen kids have outlets um, with, other, with other elements such as toys through their play. One of the big powerful ones that always stands out, stands out to me is from a Diane Levin um, book um, on the war play dilemma where um, I'm gonna take you back a little bit to the Oklahoma City bombing experience that happened a while back ago when um, the building collapsed and the children started to play. Um, in her example in the book, the kids started to have the building collapse as they were playing because they were dealing with the stress, they were scared. And so the teacher came up and the kid said, well, what can we do to not have complete destruction? How can we save the people in the building? So it's not always the same scenario. And she and the kids emotionally talked through, what if we can save the, the people in the building? Would it make you feel better? And the kids said, yeah, it would make us feel a little bit more safe. And, and so that emotional support that sometimes play provides kids is very, very important. Cognitive, cognition is something we all care about. I mean, we've, we've seen it through the pushing down of academics. We've seen a push down of numeracy and, and language skills earlier than we've ever seen with young kids. We see preschools doing the work of kindergartners and, and, and so on. But play is a great way to introduce academics in a non-stressful, non-anxious way. Play games with kids and learn concepts. Counting, number meaning are great ways. I'll just give you one example of a game called Trouble that young kids play. That game was a staple in my house with my kids. We played that game all the time. In fact, we went through probably, I can't even tell you how many games we bought of that game because we, we broke it. Either the dice wouldn't go or the pieces got lost because it was literally often a daily experience. My wife and my two kids would get around the board and we would play that game probably sometimes for 30 minutes. And my kids were learning number skills, how to count, and eventually game strategy. When you look at a game like Trouble and Cognition, you quickly realize how kids think about playing. A game like Trouble, when you pop a number and you get a six, all of you, I think, know how to play Trouble. Six allows you to take out another person. So when kids take out that person and they get another six, they don't think to take another person out. They continue to move that one piece around the board until they get it to home base, and then they worry about getting another six. So they're, so they're learning strategy. They're learning problem solving. They're learning how to figure the game out. As they get older and the more they play, they start to realize, oh, wait, I have a piece out. I've moved. I have a six. I can take another piece out. And, and, and eventually they are able to beat adults because they've conceptualized a new way of playing the game, a new way of thinking. Is that not cognition that we want our students to be able to develop? and conceptualize and implement in their daily repertoire. That's a huge, huge skill. It's almost like that aha moment. Wow, I just figured something really big out. Now I, will, now I got a 50-50 chance of winning and I will lose. Because I'll tell you, my kids never won in trouble till they figured out that strategy. It was too hard to win. They needed a lot of luck to win. But once they figured out the adult strategy, they were able to conceptualize mathematically differently. They knew how to count to get to, okay, I need a five to take you back. A whole new level of thinking opened up for them. So again, those games, and that's just one example. There's so many other games that are great for that kind of mathematical concept building and num number development. 
Spatial reasoning, another huge thing that we uh, want kids to know, block play, Legos, any kind of construction pieces allow kids to develop spatial thinking. I love when I go to preschool classes, or even kindergarten classes, when kids play with blocks and they're building a house. And sometimes I just sit and I'll watch and they've built the body of the house and now they're putting on the roof. And they realize that they've, they've used up all the long pieces and they can't finish the roof because all the pieces left can't complete the spatial dimensions of the building and they have to rethink. It's going back to that failure. They failed and they have to now break down their house, save four or five of the long pieces for later on to make that roof. And they do it again. And now they've developed that spatial ability to say, okay, I need certain blocks to be able to finish certain spatial creations that I'm making. Again, those are great cognitive developments for children. They happen naturally through play, through successes and through failures and through rethinking. Vocabulary acquisition. Think about the sense of story children develop as they play. Have you ever really sat down and observed kids playing house? The literacy, the sense of story they develop, the themes, they are rich in language. They are rich in text. They are rich in this whole, it's almost a full, like a book chapter is flowing out. So they're developing a lot of language, a lot of language skill, a lot of vocabulary, just through playing something like housekeeping. Again, that's just one example of many that kids do. Increased attention span. We often say kids have short attention spans. And to some extent they do when it's applied to academics. But kids certainly do not demonstrate the same short attention spans when they play. Attention spans in play tend to be very long, especially when children are free to choose what they play. Before, the, before COVID, I was in a classroom and I was watching kids play superheroes. And they started playing outside and they played the entire time they were outside. So for, I, I would say like maybe 20, 25 minutes. Never got bored, never got distracted, never ended the play. They got back in the classroom and they continued to play the game in, in a different way because they were indoor now, so they couldn't quite do the same kind of running around. So they modified it, they reconceptualized it, but the attention was still on the play. So a kids' attention spans are not as short as we think when it's something that they're interested in doing. When it's something they're not focused on or interested in engaging in, of course, their attention spans are short. So are ours as adults. If we do something that's not interesting or fun, we're not gonna focus. We're gonna change the channel. We're gonna do something else. Kids are the same way. Attention span is prolonged and is increased when it's interesting to them and fun for them and play-based. Creativity, problem solving, multiple perspectives, all those things kids share through play. Well, how do you think? What do you think? Why do you wanna be that character? I mean, all those things they, they talk out and problem solving. And I'll move on because time is important. Physical development. Fine motor skills through puzzle play. Buttoning, zipping, all those things kids do with their fine motor skills. There's a lot of Montessori materials we can buy that kids can actually practice some of those fine, fine motor skills as they, as they play. Buttoning a shirt on a doll is, is a way to, to learn how to, how to do some of those skills when they button their own clothes. Gross motor play. Active movement, running, jumping, muscle coordination, all that is developed and learned through play. They learn about how their body works. They learn what they can and cannot do. They learn to take risks. I love watching kids take risks on the playground. I know sometimes we frown upon that, but that's how kids explore what they can and cannot do. They figure things out. They learn their limitations. Social development through play. This is one of my favorite um, things I uh, paraphrase from Hard Up. It's, it's an older piece of research, but the single best childhood predictor of adult adaptation is not IQ, which we place so much value on. It's not grades in school and it's not classroom behavior, although we'd like to think it is. It's rather the ability to wish the child can get along with others. That is really the 
biggest indicator of adult success. And guess what? Kids learn that when they play. That is the one thing kids learn when they play, and that is how to get along with other kids, how to deal with the conflict that's around them, dealing with the fact that, you know what, you can't be the dad right now. You've got to be the dog. And how do you deal with that? Kids get anxious. They get upset, but they figure out a way to resolve those conflicts, resolve those issues, and deal with them. And maybe the next day, figure out a new way to say, hey, I was a dog yesterday. Can I be the dad today or the mom or whatever the role um, may be? All those are very, very important cooperation, social skills that kids need to have. We have a lot of kids entering kindergarten who don't have those skills. And it becomes the job of the primary educational system to teach those skills. When in the past, that was the priority of preschool priority of children three, four, and five is to develop those social, those emotional skills so they can come into the classroom and be good students, pay attention, raise their hand, do the kind of things we need them to do to be successful in school, rather than focusing on the kind of things that play helps children achieve naturally as they're playing, as they're engaging as young children. The other big question we have to ask ourselves is how much do we limit play? And are children truly free to play? I hear the word free play all the time. And I know a lot of us use that word. It makes me cringe because there really is no such thing as free play. We limit play all the time for kids. Think about, you know, when kids are playing, are we meeting the needs of the child or our own need, the need of the teacher, the parent? you know, when we decide to limit the play. I've been to classroom and the teacher says, boys and girls, it's too loud in here. Well, is it too loud for the kids or is it too loud for the teacher? Because the kids don't seem to mind. They're engaged in play. So when we redirect children in their play, are we doing it for the benefit of them or are we doing it for the benefit of us, the adult in the classroom or the home or wherever it may be? We also survey kids in very negative ways. We tend to look for things that they're doing wrong as they play. We redirect their behavior, stop doing that, or don't do that, or, or stop this, stop that, instead of focusing on the positive things they're doing and reinforcing those. I love the way you built that, or I love the way you're talking to each other. I love the way you created that art form to incorporate in your dramatic play. Some of those kind of uh, behaviors. And ultimately, it's the choice. Do kids really have the choice to play? And I hope the answer is yes, but I want you in the back of your mind to think about how much do we as adults control that choice? Can I take out the puzzles? No, you may not. Can I bring those toys to the block area? No, you may not. Can I go down the slide backwards? No, you may not, right? So there is some choice in play. There is a level of choice we afford students and kids, but there's also a layer of choice that we take away. And a lot of it is due to safety. And sometimes it's just our, our willingness not to want to clean things up because we don't want those things taken out. So think about how much choice are we allowing children with respect to play? And how does that lack of choice stifle their development, creativity, and learning? Because we're limiting it. Peer culture is that other part of play that all of us know about, but probably have never heard the term around. And kids deal with two cultures. They have to deal with the culture of when they come to a preschool of that school, the rules they have to follow, things they have to do, the things the teacher expects. And there's also the culture of the peers, what the kids do, what the kids value, what the routines are. And I, I kind of gave the classic Corsara definition, Bill Corsara, to me, is kind of the godfather of peer culture. Um, and he has a very, very basic definition. It's a set of activities or routines, artifacts, values, and concerns that children produce and share in interaction with peers. And peer culture is important to play because children have to understand the peer culture around them. Peer culture connects kids together. If you can think back, I'm thinking of these, remember those little rubber bands, silly bands that kids used to wear? 
and they used to buy them by the dozen and put them all over their arms. Think about how that became a peer culture that brought kids together, right? They traded them. They talked about them. They, they were proud to have them, right? That one little artifact brought a lot of kids together socially. Kids who may have never played together, been around each other, but the fact that they brought that artifact to a classroom bonded them together. And that's just one example of a peer culture. There's so many others. I mean, kids playing superheroes is a peer culture. But the key to that peer culture is kids have to have exposure to it. Because one thing kids won't do with play is teach others how to play. If kids are playing superheroes, they're not going to stop and teach me how to play Batman or who Wonder Woman is or what Superman is, right? It's understood that you know that knowledge. You understand that peer culture as you enter that play. So to enter that play seamlessly, you have to have a background knowledge and a background of what those superheroes do. Unfortunately, those skills come from the home, right? What if you're a child that doesn't get to watch those cartoons or have access to those toys? You miss out on a play culture that's very, very important in your classroom that you're in. So you sometimes become an outsider in play because you simply don't have access to a peer culture that children value in a classroom. So thinking about the importance of peer culture and how it impacts the way kids play is also very, very important and is impacting how children play. Television is a very, very big component of how children engage in social play. They take a lot of social cues from TV, from cartoons, from videos, YouTube. We'll talk a little more about technology um, in a little bit. So changes to play. Do children today play less or has the way children play changed? Think about that. Don't answer it. Just think about it. I'll explain in a second. Pay for play versus child-directed play. We spend a lot of time today paying for our children to have social experiences rather than children developing their own experiences. We take children to places like Chuck E. Cheese, bounce houses, and, and, and so on, instead of allowing them the freedom to just play and control their own play. I remember playing sports in my backyard or in our apartment complex with other kids. And now I see a lot of kids playing sports as early as preschool in organized clubs where parents pay for that experience. So even when children do play, a lot of times they're playing where someone else is controlling that experience, an adult or, or, or someone other than the children themselves. Technology is changing the way kids play. Um, Christy and in another session just previously has talked about technology. It is a huge, huge game changer in play. Children seek it out, they value it, they want it, and once they have it, it's hard for them to put it down. We have what we call it with young kids, a technological addiction. If you've ever tried to take a device away from a five-year-old, be prepared for a tantrum. Their brain is wired to seek out those devices. And the problem is, is we become bad role models at that. Think about how often we are on our devices. That phone never leaves our side. We check it all the time. We model the behavior for kids. So of course, as they get older, They've seen us on that device their entire lives. That device is very valuable to them. They value it. They want it. And so they opt into wanting that device more than anything. And we comply as parents. We provide those devices to kids, whether it's a tablet or a phone or wherever it may be. Think about when we, we kids see adults in social gatherings. You may have a group of 10 people and everybody's on their phone. No one's talking. Well, kids learn those behaviors. They start to see those behaviors as normative. And so they start to opt in some of, into some of those isolated behaviors, solitary behaviors. I'd rather watch a video on my phone than talk to someone else or, or do something else. I'd rather play a game by myself on, my, on a device than play a game with somebody else. So again, there, there's some changes that we're seeing with children. But one thing we're not asking is, what's the impact on brain development as children transition to more technologically driven play in a way from quote unquote traditional play. 20 years ago, we didn't think about that. 
because kids were still engaged primarily in traditional toy play, outdoor play. But certainly we're seeing a shift away from a lot of that. And I'll show you some, a little bit of data from a research study we completed. Um, actually, it's been published. So if you're interested, you can hit me up. I can certainly send you the paper um, on that as well. So we have to regulate play. How much technology play do we provide? Is it, a, is it an hour? Is it two? Is it three? Or is it however many kids want? Outdoor play, how many kids go outside to play? Indoor play, when they're inside, how much of it is, is technology or non-technology play, right? So we have to start figuring out how do we regulate play in our homes and even in our classrooms? Should we force kids to conform to societal expectations, such as providing certain objects of a certain color, toys that are for boys versus girls, right? What kind of experiences do you want kids to have with those objects, right? When kids go to a, to a store, the aisles are divided by boy-girl toys. So kids naturally gravitate towards certain toys versus others. So how do we negotiate that, those types of things for, for children? And then again, we have to remember, there is no free play. We always limit the experiences. Kids may have an idea. They may want to do something. It is up to the adult to allow that experience or to disallow it. And I think that's always important to keep in the back of our minds. Unless there's free play, and I mean completely free play, kids are at the mercy of adults when they play because we can easily take it away and stop it at any point because we are the adults and our word is kind of the law, whether it's in the classroom or in the home. So here's that research um, table from the, from the study we did from a couple of years ago. Um, so if you look at play, so we had 33 families complete a, a journal over a typical um, weekday and over a typical weekend. And we gave them a diary with, with every half an hour um, checked off. And so every half an hour, they could write what the kids were doing. And so they would, for 24 hours, would just basically document what the kids were doing at that time. And so if you look at during a typical weekday, so take in mind the weekday is also kids went to preschool that day. So they were in preschool and then they came home and then the, the data is from home to bed. So technology play over a typical weekday was about 53 hours for those 33 families reporting. Non-technology play was 59 hours and outdoor play 17 and a half. So you can see how outdoor play during a typical weekday is really almost non non-existent for, for many kids. Um, and you can see that technology play is almost the same as non-technology play, meaning the kids are interacting with technology a lot of the time. Weekend, luckily things change. Um, and we do see more outdoor play. I mean, parents noted things like, you know, we went to the zoo, um, you know, we did some yard work, you know, we did say, you know, we went for a bike ride. So parents are getting out more on the weekend. But you're starting to see a trend in about the last 10 years of technology play really shooting up in terms of hours spent and other forms of play really going down. The biggest one is outdoor play. Remember, outdoor play historically has been the biggest, most popular form of play for kids. It is what kids did from sunup to sundown. They were outside playing. And now it is actually one of the least engaged forms of play for children, unless it's in organized sports or adult driven activities. Kids are not opting out to go outside when they've got other distractors inside their home. So thinking about that data, thinking about the kind of ways children are, are playing. So just to kind of sum up, because I do want to leave a little bit of room for questions, because I know somebody did actually post something um, from Donna posted. So thank you, Donna. Um, so changes in play, we have this focus on academic versus the social. We have become really, really focused on kids getting academic enrichment and starting kindergarten or school readiness, however you want to uh, label it, as academically prepared. That comes with a cost. That comes with time being devoted to something other than play. And so one of the things I always share with my own students and with, and with teachers is figure out ways to incorporate academics into play. Kind of what we talked about at the onset of this presentation. Play games, allow kids other avenues 
to think about problem solving, counting, writing, reading, whatever it may be in the context of play. There are so many rich ways to allow kids to play and still learn. And I think we've, we've kind of gotten so enthralled in the academic components of children now and trying to get kids to count to 100 when they're four and five. And I was thinking, like, does that skill really matter? Does a child need to be able to count to 100? Do they ever really need to count to 100 as they play or as they do things? No. Those skills will come and develop as they enter kindergarten, as, as they actually need to do those kind of thinking uh, things. For young kids, they don't need to worry about that. It's the social, it's the emotional. All those things are really important and it helps prepare kids for success later on in school. Using play as that primary function of time spent on task or time spent doing, I think is really, really important. We focus a lot of time on drill and practice. One of my least favorite is Teachers giving kids flashcards at circle time. And kids memorize those flashcards. You've probably seen it a lot, right? It's the same cards every day. And kids memorize the flashcards because after a while, we just memorize them. I mean, we can't read them, but we memorize them. And we do them for you know a month. And the teacher says, great, you guys know how to read these words. The problem is they really don't. Because if you write those words on a, on, a, on a different context or a different board or somewhere else, the child can't read it. They simply memorize it in that context and the way it looks. So again, providing more play instead of some of that drill and practice is just a better use of our time. I mean, again, technology. What do we do with technology when kids want to opt into it more than anything else? That's been a big stressor for many families. I have families ask me all the time, what do I do? And I would say, try to figure out a way to limit it early on. Because once the kids get, get at it, and there are no boundaries to it, they become addicted to it. And it's really, really hard to pull kids away from it. Very, very hard. You know, is it an hour a day? Is it two hours a day? That's a personal family choice, but there has to probably be at some point, some parameters around it, because otherwise that's all kids are going to want to do. And it's going to take away from some of the other um, uh, remarks. Brilliant, I'm reading your thing. Yeah, Robert Louv, that's a great book. He talks about so in a lot of things that are happening to kids medically as well, because kids don't get to play outside anymore. So a lot of allergies, a lot of the immune breakdowns that kids have is because they're not getting outside, interacting with the environment. They're not playing outside anymore. So there are, so we have things like allergies and all those things we used to really have, but have limitations. That is a really, really good book. Highly recommended. Thank you, Belinda. And then finally, just to conclude, you know, what can teachers, parents do? You know, set up learning spaces where children can play. But make play a learning experience some of the time, not all the time. Some of the time, kids just need to be kids and just need time to play. I understand we're academically focused. We're interested in the school readiness because it's such a big priority right now. But there needs to be a time we allow kids to just be kids and for kids to just play. Play with the kids. Get on the floor and play with them. Get the, get the trouble board out and play with them. As they're playing, as they're, as they're counting, as they're learning scaffold, where they may make mistakes in, in, in counting or in a sequence or wherever it may be. Um, pick out challenges for them. You know, have a bunch of different bears and say, hey, let's sort some bears. How many of you can you know, pick out all the yellow bears? How many of the yellow bears were we able to find? Road count them for me. Are there more yellow bears or red bears? Make some challenges to make it more fun for the kids to do. Maybe provide them with some forceps where they can't use their hands, but have to use some other kind of skill to be able to kind of make it fun. Have them drop them in buckets or, or something just to make it more playful if you still want to get the academic point across instead of just a drill and practice. Um, and then play games that incorporate social behaviors. You know, games help us follow rules. It helps us learn how to take turns. It helps us learn how to count and so on and so on and so on and so on. There is so much social skill, so much cognitive skill, so much emotional skill, so much physical skill that is learned just from simply playing with kids or letting kids play. And I will stop there and I will gladly um, take any questions and I will actually exit out of my share screen. Yeah, uh, um, Ruslan, we did, I started a conversation when you were talking about 
um, play as a way for children to handle and process stress and trauma. I was thinking of our current stress and trauma for children being COVID and um, just asked if people were seeing COVID related play and a couple of people did, well, Teresa said um, that she saw children giving COVID shots in the dramatic play area. And then Donna's comment was about her grandchildren acting out um, mm -hmm. the typhus outbreak because they had been watching Little House on the Prairie. Um, so, you know, similar to some of our experiences today. Yeah, play has been, COVID has been tough on play. I mean, when we were isolated, a lot of kids, they couldn't play with other kids. I mean, they were home, they were home with, with their parents. That's, a, that's for young children, two, three, four, and five. That's a lot of, that's a big part of their life, not to be able to grow, learn, and develop. And, and, and thinking about those kids that were four and then had to go to kindergarten this year and how much they missed out on that year, maybe from virtual learning, maybe just from virtual playing and just socially being around other kids and knowing how to pick out social cues. You know, when someone approaches you, how do you react? How do you respond? How do you, how do you respond to somebody says, let's play this? Right. You know, we had months and months where kids didn't have those kind of opportunities in those kind of experiences. You know, and some kids are still not having that because some parents are still opting into uh, virtual um, schooling and virtual environments for kids where they're still home 15, 16 months later, where, you know, half their lives now, you know, for a four year old has been spent maybe in some kind of form of isolation from other kids. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to at some point pay a price for that um, as kids start to enter kindergarten and start to engage in social environments where for the last year and a half, they've been in environments solely around their families and they've not experienced a rich social play experience. And I think schools have to be prepared for that. Kindergarten teachers have to be prepared for that, but also preschool teachers. Those kids that are turning five and gonna be coming into your classrooms they're going to have anxieties, they're going to have stressors, and they may need help learning how to play. You know, because some kids will need to be taught how to do certain play things that we often take for granted, how to pretend, how to imagine, how to create, how to problem solve, how to construct knowledge. All those things we think are natural ways that kids engage and learn. But when you don't have those social opportunities and social experiences, kids miss out on that. And then we have to end up teaching those skills that are typically natural for them. It makes me think about developmentally children starting with more parallel play before they're able to really interact in cooperative play. And we may have to take some children back to mm -hmm. that place of being able to play side by side with similar materials and moving eventually into those more um, higher developed skills. It's a good point. I'm thinking we may have to go be beyond that. So looking at, so you mentioned Parton's parallel play. So Parton had this notion of unoccupied onlooker, parallel associative and cooperative play. We may have to go back to onlooker, where kids are simply sitting and watching other kids play to learn what to do. Because parallel play takes into account that they already know what to do. They're playing and somebody else is playing, but they're just completely oblivious of each other. We may have to even go a step back and, and have kids actually do observations and sit in a classroom and just watch kids play and say, oh, that's how you do it. I mean, kids do that now already, but that's because they're trying to figure out a peer culture maybe. But I think that may be real for many kids who have not experienced play in a social dynamic. And they have to sit instead of parallel play or associated play or cooperative play. They're just figuring out what, what to even do. What I do in this social setting, how do I even get into a peer play situation? Do I ask? Do I bring a prop? What if I come in and they say, no, what do I do then? Right. There's a lot of anxiety and stress for kids trying to figure out how do I make myself available for other kids to want to engage with me or play with me. And those things are learned early on. But when you don't have that experience, obviously, kids miss out on that and they have to be taught. And we have to provide behavior modifications and, and play strategies for kids to be able to do that. And that, to me, is scary. When something as natural as play, we have to systematically teach the kids almost like they're a robot. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And that's scary that we may be at a point like that with some children coming back to school, whether it's this year or, or maybe they're still virtual this year in school. 
but then next year? And how do teachers do that if it's not kindergarten in first grade when kids may have missed out on two, three years of some kind of face-to-face -face social instruction? So yeah, COVID has not been kind in that regard. I agree, Donna, play is an important part of, uh, of everything, working out their fears, anxieties. It is, it, it's one of those natural ways for kids to cope and, and really manage the stress that they're, that they're dealing with. As adults, we can talk to our friends and talk things out and, and get advice. Kids oftentimes don't understand the stressors and the fears that they have. And so they have to figure out other outlets for it. And play seems to be they're just that natural outlet, play, art, those things to be just natural outlets for them to deal and cope with their anxieties and fears. Anyone else? Still got some time. This is more of a, uh, an observation than a question, but, and then this might give you hope, Ruslan, or maybe it'll be a future research project. But um, one thing I've noticed during COVID, I, I'm a camper, I camp, and uh, it's been difficult getting sites because camping during COVID was the one place people felt comfortable because they would be in their own camper or their own tent. And I've also noticed that there's uh, a camping, a place selling campers around me has um, is running out of campers because, again, it's become so popular. And when I do camp before COVID, what I loved most about camping as an educator was it was the last place uh, where children are like riding their bikes and playing games and there's no adult supervision. It's like this sense of, and I don't think it's false, sense of security that parents let their children ride the campground, um, you know, until like nighttime, like I used to do as a kid and I get the sense that children don't do anymore. But after COVID, I noticed, I was wondering how this is going to affect children, but I noticed that there's still that sense of wonder and getting out with children they don't know, creating games with um, whatever they have around them. And the, the, the cutest thing, just this last time I went camping at Mommy Bay, was there were these children playing a game. They were racing. After they raced, this little boy announced, you won and you won. And this little girl said to him, well, that's not what you should say. You should say, Kathy won and Ruslan came in second. And the little boy said, well, I would, but I don't know your name and I don't know his name and I don't know her name. So these kids were getting together and playing and um, I know I know camping is a small microcosm of community, but it, it is interesting. And then I think about, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Are they feeling comfortable in that place because it's nature? And though even though we they have internet access now at campgrounds, they'd rather be outside because nature is right outside their door. Just a thought. Yeah, no, it is great. And I think families that choose to camp and do those outdoor things, I think have a different viewpoint on technology to begin with. They, they do go camping to um, kind of unplug. I know my wife and our kids, we went up to Michigan and we camped for a weekend and it was a natural way to unplug. You know, we were camping, you know, the internet service was bad. So that was one of the ways my kids unplugged because let's face it, they couldn't log in. I mean, they believe me, they tried, but eventually they gave up. And you know what we ended up having, you know, we played cards, we went hiking, we went shopping, we went eating, we, uh, we talked, we watched TV together. We did a lot more family stuff than when typically, well, my daughter's in college now, so she's not home. But when my son's even home, if we're doing stuff together, he's on his phone doing something. And if I'm talking to him, I'm talking to him while he's on his phone. And so it's I'm competing with this device constantly. And, and, and it's, it's not just him. It's it's kids in general, where that device is the priority. And I become kind of that secondary nuisance in his ear. And sometimes I have to say things two, three times to get his attention, because ironically, he didn't hear me the first two times because he is so focused on the screen. So yeah, I, I, I am optimistic about, you know, obviously the, the camping community and, and, and their, and, you know, their view of technology, but I'm just seeing so much of it now, Belinda, and how pervasive it is. You know, if you go to a restaurant now, you see kids on devices, no one's talking to each other. Um, you know, the parents are on their phone, the kids are on their phone. It's, 
kids are developing very antisocial behaviors and you take away a lot of the time they engage in play, where are they learning those skills? That's where I'm concerned about the brain development of, I'm okay being alone because I got my device. And I think those kind of things are, you know, I don't know what the next 20 years is gonna look like, but I certainly know where the last 10 years has been. And we've certainly progressed very, very quickly with children's access to technology and just how cheap it's become and how easily accessible it is. I mean, kids have tablets now that are their own. They, they use them, they're their own. Three-year-olds have their own devices. Um, kids are playing on their parents' phones um, without much reservation. Um, here you go. So I just worry about just the reconceptualization of what parents are seeing as viable play. And I think a lot of parents are opting into technology as a new normative viable play. And I think those of us in education, we certainly can understand how that is not, because we know different, but your average parent does not. And so when they see these devices, they see other kids engage with them, they see it as normal behavior. They don't think about brain development. They don't think about social engagement. They don't think about being outside and playing. Those kind of things go out the window. And, and so I worry about that component of it. And that's kind of that next phase we're trying to study. And I know my colleagues in Europe and I are, are trying to look at that next batch of data to kind of see what schools, like preschools in general, are doing with technology. I'll tell you right now, our first gleaning at the data says that luckily everyone is in, in the education world is cautious of technology. They're looking at other forms of play, such as traditional play, outdoor play, as still the key agents of how kids learn and develop. And technology is, I don't want to say frowned upon, but is a distant third when you talk to educators, at least, about its role in children's play and development. But that's an initial look at the data, more obviously to follow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slutsky. We really appreciate ending a day about school readiness on the topic of play. I think it's so critical to maintain its role in children's lives and in whatever we mean by school readiness. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna turn it to Heather. <laughs> 